And this book uses a, a compilation of methods to ensure effective forecasting for, for the future. And he is, con he is consulted with many, many governments around the world. He was CINCON coordinator for the Committee of the Future in the early 70s and founding partner for Future Options Room, along with uh, Roy Mason and Scott Joy. And the, the other people involved in that were Alan Toffler, Herman Kahn, who we all know well, and Ted Gordon. But more than that, Jerry has helped to craft the section of SALT II Treaty that prohibited USSR from deploying the fractional orbital bombardment system. And he created Karanet, a computer network, which CGNET services later acquired and introduced packet switching to numerous countries, especially in developing world. Jerry's familiar with the developing world. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in the late 60s, perhaps early 70s in uh, Malawi. And after that, he was a second in command vice president of, of uh, Partners for Productivity, which had started microfinance in Kakamega, Kenya in 1966. So with that, I'll let you, Jerry introduce um, the way in which they did these scenarios for the COVID future and answer some of the very important questions about what's going to happen with pandemics and COVID in the near and medium futures. Jerry. Thank you. Uh, let me share a screen here, see if I do this right. Let me know if you see all that okay. Yes. Good, okay. Um, the, um, we, we got this request from the, from the Red Cross because uh, they were, this is in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, when they didn't know there was even gonna be a second wave <laughs> and they were just getting into the first wave. But they thought there might be a second wave, but they didn't have time to think about it, let alone a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth wave. Uh, so they asked us to sort of think ahead because they were busy getting shelters for people, blood drives and all that sort of stuff, and really didn't have a chance to think ahead. So that was, that was the motivation. Uh, the report uh, is 145 pages and you can download it from that web link there. I assume that the PowerPoint presentation will be available for everybody afterward. Um, and it was to organize the three uncertainties into into three scenarios. Now, I want to pause here a second. It, it is quite normal, conventional, for a lot of pop futures to organize scenarios based upon two uncertainties, say, pandemic gets worse, pandemic gets better, world stability, world instability. So they got two uh, on one side, and two at the top, you get a little four by four grid. And then they say, well, in this scenario, strategy works this way in this scenario, strategy works over here, which misses the entire point that Herman Kahn responded to in inventing scenarios to begin with. Uh, and, and this next, what I say here might be more important than the COVID stuff I'll talk about, because this is important for all of us to, to think about, is a lot of times people forget that a scenario is as the word says in the art world, it's a story. It connects a present tense to a future tense. It's not a description of a future tense. That's a description of a future state. That's perfectly fine to do. Uh, but it's not a projection. That's a mathematical projection perfectly. A scenario is a series of cause and effect links that connect the present to the future condition. The reason I stress this is this is how you find out what you didn't know, that you didn't know you didn't know, but you should know if you're going to talk about that future. Because how did you get there? Herman Kahn used to love to say things like, you can't write me a scenario to show me if that's possible. And that's the idea. You'd have to show the cause and effect links. Not that we're talking about the truth, but how do these things fit together? And, and when you do this, you'll always get to a point and say, I have no idea what happens next. Stop writing. 
do some research, <laughs> talk to people until it makes sense. And, and, I'll, and as we go down the road, I'll say how that actually happened you know, during this work as well. But so since there were so many uncertainties, I think it was something like 30 uncertainties when we started, the idea of a two by two grid was silly. So we listed all of the uncertainties down and said, well, if it, if, if, it, if, if it works out, what does it look like? If it doesn't work out, what does it look like? And what's sort of the mixed bag, so to speak? So this is a way we could take all of this stuff that's being researched around the world in articles and organize it into three columns, uh, into these uncertainties, uh, which took a very complex task and started to make it a little bit uh, manageable. So uh, each describes how the pandemic would evolve from then the beginning out to January the tier. Uh, so if you want to <laughs> read those scenarios and compare them up. But remember, part of the idea of a scenario is to open up the mind to possibilities, find out what you had considered. It's not necessarily to describe the truth of how you get to the future. Uh, we took input from about 250 medical doctors, public health officials, emergency relief staff, economists, and future. So there's a lot of people participating around the world. Um, it pro provided a coherent, integrated, holistic news. At the time that we did this, the news was throwing at you just pieces of information all over the place. And it was very hard, it was not coherent. People were not fitting it. It has not all fit together. So uh, we uh, tried to address that issue. This may not be how it evolves. This is a coherent, direction how it could evolve this way, a coherent direction how it can evolve this way. So that as people read it, they say, hmm, I didn't think about that part. Hmm, oh, I should do this. And that's part of the value of this thing. Uh, each is about 10 pages. I pause on that because if you take a look at even the World uh, Economic Forum stuff and, uh, and Shell oil company stuff, their scenarios tend to be just a few pages and they're generalizations. They're not really cause and effect links. These are. So well, there's 30 pages of text there, the three scenarios. Uh, it becomes useful for planning. And, and, and I would also say public understanding, which may have been the most valuable because these scenarios did get out around the world to the public. Uh, you know, so they sort of see their way into the future uh, a little bit coherently rather than just scattering information all over the place. And uh, the Red Cross uh, vice president, senior vice president said, these scenarios are the best integration, keyword integration of medical health, socioeconomic and psychological factors of the possible future course of the pandemic that we have. Um, so this was the approach we had. Now, Anitra did a very good job of already explaining that. So I don't know if I really need to explain this much. But when you do a scenario, if you're gonna to put together a team together, you know, you ask the obvious question, what's the knowledge that you need and skills? Then you go out and recruit those people. That's what we did. We got a good little A team together. Uh, we reviewed the research articles and shared uh, the findings on listserv. And we discussed what we didn't understand with experts so that we would understand. Then we held weekly meetings uh, to review all these articles. One of the things that was different about this, when you do, uh, same thing, let's say the future of um, environmental security, like we were talking about before we began. Um, there's not that many people, so to speak, working on it. And it's not that many research documents that you got to go through. But with this one, this was a worldwide event and simultaneously happening in real time. So the articles that were coming out and the research coming out was just flooding everywhere. You had to keep track of Japan, in China, in India, South Africa, etc. It was just a, 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 an avalanche of stuff. It was the hardest environmental scanning assignment I ever had in my life because it was real time, worldwide, and everybody had something to say about it. And you had to look at stuff because sometimes there's important insights uh, that are even in op-ed pieces that you should look at. Anyway, so we had these little meetings that once a week to review all that. Then we've created what's called a characteristics matrix. That's what I talked about. You list all the uncertainties down one column. And then the next column is uh, what you know would be the mixed result. Next one is positive and the next one is negative. So no matter what article you've read or what research you've read, there's a place to pull out the key insights and throw them into these columns. And then those columns then become an organizational structure for doing your scenarios. Uh, now, there's a lot of questions that we had that weren't answerable just by the literature search and the, and the newspaper article research. Uh, so we did Delphi, real-time Delphi. 
quick pause for those that don't know. The conventional Delphi, I'm sure you do know, is a questionnaire that results for the second round, the results of that form a third round and can be more. Now, the nice thing about that Delphi is it forces people to respond to other people's ideas and estimates without the rank or personality being persuasive, but just the information being persuasive. And that's very good each round like that builds. It's, it's still the best way to do a Delphi, but it can take six months or seven or eight months to do a Delphi that way. We didn't have that much time. We were doing this thing real fast. So the real-time Delphi is where you still have the question, you're like a regular Delphi, and then, but you can see other people's comments while they're put, once, once they hit the return key, you immediately can see what anybody has said about anything so that you can have an organized discussion un anonymously, so no one knows who you are, but you can organize complex stuff and, and, and say by a certain date, whatever's there, that's, that's the conclusions. So you've, you're asking people to come back in, see what other people have said. You can edit your own stuff. You don't have to keep going in a linear way. You can go back to the original stuff and edit the original stuff in there. And so that your, your, your text may be better at the end of the two weeks, whatever it was, than when you first put it in because you're seeing feedback from other people on there. So the real-time Delphi is we did five of these little suffers. Uh, the first one was the focus on just medical and health issues in the United States. And the second one did health and medical, but international, because international obviously influences the United States, vice versa. Then the third one was on socioeconomic stuff in the United States and socioeconomic stuff international. So there we had economists and people like that. Then the fifth one we did, uh, which turned out to be uh, interesting and had some good input for us, but we really couldn't compute a state of the pandemic index because uh, the way when we do a, a future index, you know, uh, like a state of the future index, it tends to have 20 years of data and 10 years of data. And I won't go through all the complexity, but you had to have, that's your basics. And well, we didn't have 20 years of data on this <laughs> pandemic. So you really couldn't do it. So we did enough of it so that in a future World Health Organization or somebody else can take it on. Because the idea of tracking a disease with some history to it is a good way uh, to help manage it. Okay, then we wrote this draft scenario was based on all this input. And then we, uh, then the scenario team had at it and criticized each other's scenarios. And we redrafted. Then we sent them out for external reviews with various experts. And then we redrafted and that we became the final product. They were circulated uh, October 13th, uh, 2020. So that's a, a 2020, 2021, I guess, yeah. And um, I guess it's 20. I'm losing my mind here, 20. And they were distributed through Dr. Fauci's office. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that they, they, they sent it out to NIH. They thought, thought it was pretty good stuff. Of course, the Red Cross had it. And it was uh, it also circulated through our 70 nodes around the world. And it was translated into a bunch of languages uh, as well. And we used it for conferences and give talks and sessions like this around the world. So it really did get quite a lot of circulation. And I think it did help uh, the conversation to be more holistic rather than just looking at one thing. Although still <laughs> much of the news has one piece of information, one piece of information. But there's people started to see the larger picture. Three scenarios, the first one was America endures. This is the one that's mixed positive and negative. Uh, and I did it with another guy named Henderson who uh, was uh, the John Hopkins uh, demographics data, data guy is very helpful. Uh, the second one, uh, this, is the, this is where it's, the, it, 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 the virus continues on, coherence isn't there, uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, continuation of the Trump uh, administration goes on, and uh, there's no coherence in, in the strategy and internationally. There's no leadership in the United States, uh, and uh, a lot of discord, and it's a really uh, depressing scenario. So to help Ted Gordon, who, by the way, gave us the third stage of the Apollo rocket, so when someone says it doesn't take a rocket scientist, I say, yes, it does, and there he is. The other guy, Watkins, was an economist out of the World Bank. And uh, Elizabeth Flores was our director of research. So they were the ones that sort of like took all the negative stuff and made it look terrible. Um, and then the third one, if things go right, Paul Sappho, you may know, is one of the leading Silicon Valley futurists. And Bannon Garrett, uh, who was on the National uh, Intelligence Council's uh, scenario stuff. 
uh, and they were the ones looking at the positive, positive side, how things work out, uh, coherence comes in, virus and vaccines get done. So when we did this, there's no, we were not clear about whether vaccines were gonna be done. I mean, there was not a whole lot there at the time. Okay, so the, here's what I say, the holistic approach that everything had, each scenario had to address the business situation, the employment situation, the finance situation. We didn't just look at whether there's vaccines or not, or treatments and testing, contact tracing. We also looked at the attitudes of people, the social coherence, uh, leadership and political as well as the finance, and what was the economic security situation. So this was the holistic approach when I say we did that. Now here's the characteristics matrix. Uh, if you ever intend to do scenarios, I really, really ask you to do a characteristics matrix. A lot of people just write something up, describe something. So the idea is you say, you left down all the factors or characteristics or things that ought to be in the scenario. And then with your assumptions across the, the columns, whether it's positive or negative or whatever assumptions that you're using. And it can be the normal quadrant ones as well, but whatever it is, those columns there. So then this can, so you've, all your data can fit into there. And what you don't have to do stuff, you can also then use a Delphi to further uh, fill this out. Um, that last one, I just jumped over very quickly. I, I don't wanna do this because I'm afraid I might lose control uh, here because it goes out to my own, um, my own computer and coming back and forth, I didn't want to mess it up. But if anybody's interested in what the Delphi's look like, I can, I can send you that. Okay, this is another thing that we did, is we said, if, if, the, if what are the factors, or what are the things that would change the baseline scenario one to the pessimistic situation? And what are the things uh, that could change it to the optimistic? So it's a nice little listing of things. That's a good post scenario exercise to do with people. Uh, yeah. so, so how do you go from the baseline scenario to the pessimistic one? One, you open up too fast, which of course, as you remember, occurred because this is being written now between the first and the second wave in the very beginning. And so we did open up too fast and it, we did get bigger waves later on. Immunity is not reliable, phase and virus mutates. Well, at the time we hadn't had that yet because we were still in the alpha situation, but it did fade. Of course, that's why we had to go to boosters and, and so forth. it did mutate. Numbers of infections in Africa, Latin America, South Africa increased massively. This I think we're still in play with. Uh, as Nitra mentioned, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Malawi. I worked in leprosy and tuberculosis. So I was, had a lot of direct hospital. I worked at the hospitals there. And I was in the hospitals 13 years later and they hadn't changed a whole lot. Uh, and I, it's a nightmare to think how this is gonna be handled in four areas, especially when you're talking about vaccines they're supposed to have. Especially the situation I across the this is, this is, this is I, I think we've still got a long way to go. Especially that. It means the mutations coming up can still be coming up. Uh, social trust breaks down. It did break down a bit. I mean, it's, it could be broken down worse, but it's, it's not, we're not doing too well in the United States at the moment. Uh, economic stimulus packages are too small and not long enough. Well, the economic stimulus packages were pretty good in the United States, frankly. Uh, at the time we wrote this, in the beginning, it wasn't clear what was going to happen on this. And they did do pretty good because we did not slip into a depression. That was one of the things at the time, you may remember, we were in a recession for sure, we didn't know if we were going to slip further down uh, and, and then the rest of the world going into depression. That was a, a real possibility, but there was a lot of fast action on both the previous administration and the current administration that I think uh, did a fairly decent job compared to how bad it could have been. I mean, it's still not great, but it could, could have been a lot worse. So the factors that can move the United States from scenario one to the, pest, to the optimistic one. One, implementation of a whole of nation COVID-19 strategy. That didn't exist when we were writing. New York was competing against New Jersey to get protective equipment. I mean, you may remember the chaos going on. It was just a total mess. So that uh, did get addressed. Uh, so we're now much more of a coherent uh, national strategy. Reliable, fast at-home tests and vaccines became available. Well, they didn't become available during this period of time but they are now, as you know, becoming available. Good contact tracing and quarantine observed. That was not done well. Uh, 
little pause on this, and this is one of the areas where writing the scenario is important. As I was working on the baseline scenario, uh, one of the things was contact tracing. So you figure, okay, how many contact tracers do you need in the United States? Well, I didn't know, so I had to model research to find out. Then how many are there? You go, oh my God, there's a heck of a gap here. We're not, this is not gonna be successful. So I stopped writing. <laughs> I saw, I found out something I didn't know that I should know that I didn't know I shouldn't know, but I found out that I should know. So I had to stop writing. And uh, so I called up Peace Corps and I said, look, you got 7,000 Peace Corps volunteers returning from overseas because of the COVID. They're sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Why not have them volunteer to local health authorities to help do contact tracing? And the same thing about the, the military, get the local military officers to begin to do this because we, got, because we don't have a contract basis. Well, turns out Red, the Peace Corps did do it and Fauci even did a nice little video recording thanking the Peace Corps for helping out on all this first stuff. So there's an example where it's useful to do a scenario, to find out what you don't know, but then you can actually do something that needs to be done that can help the situation. And in this case, it was contact tracing the Peace Corps and the military. Um, Immunity is reliable. Virus mutate, mutates are uh, insignificant. Well, the current one may not be as significant as the Delta one, but, but these, were the, these were the things that uh, could move it to more optimistic. So if we, the mutations are not that big a deal and the immunity is reliable, it moves it into a more optimistic picture. FDA approved treatments that are more effective and are mass produced. That's just now, as you know, beginning. And uh, this was one of the big surprise to us is the uh, vaccines turned out to be much more effective uh, than usual. I mean, as you know, virus with uh, flu virus vaccines, if they're over 50 to 60% uh, effective efficacy, you, you tend to say, good. So we were figuring 65% and maybe 80% of the public. Well, we, we did a better job. Well, we haven't gotten over 80%. I think it's still two thirds done or a little bit or 70%, I guess. But the efficacy was much more effective than we expected. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, one of the impacts was the Peace Corps and collaboration with Dr. Fauci on, on contact tracing, uh, translated into China, Chinese, Korean, Israeli, and Spanish speaking countries, distributed in those countries. Uh, discussed on PBS uh, podcast conferences, distributed through our own system around the world, um, and circulated by Dr. Fauci's office and NIH through their listservs. And I have no way of proving this last comment, whether it's true or false, but what we wrote about on decentralized uh, uh, manufacturing early on is much of what the G7 ended up using the same vocabulary, but it's a logical conclusion to make. Some lessons learned, key insights, scanning far more useful since it was far more, uh, it, was, it was worldwide in real time and the scanning was far more difficult uh, as a result of that. Um, uh, it, it demonstrated the value of the real-time Delphi. You know, doing a, the, the fast two-week Delphi was a lifesaver for us. It was very effective being done. Uh, detailed scenarios connecting present and short-term future with cause and effect links and decisions expose what we did not know that we needed to know. That was the Peace Corps one I mentioned again. Uh, another thing that was interesting is even though these were short scenarios, I mean, I've never been asked to do a year and a half or two-year scenario. <laughs> Usually it's five, I mean, we even did a thousand-year scenarios back in the year 1999 in preparation for the year 2000. You know, normally futures will do 25-year or so scenarios. They're asking us for like a year and a half. We've never done anything that short. Um, but one thing that was striking, the difference between the positive scenario, even though it was only about a year and a half or two out, and the negative scenario was really gigantic difference. Really gigantic in social coherence, in law and order, in, in homelessness, in economic situations, and psychological well being. It was a gigantic difference between those two. Over it's just a very short period of time. That was surprised us. Uh, most likely is that the worst is yet to come, which unfortunately turned out to be the case. Remember, these were done back in, uh, or published in a way, back in October uh, 2020. 
And uh, as you draw the line there, you'll see that most of the lines of the growth is gigantic beyond that. And the economic impacts worldwide are still being felt in the loss of supply chain that we're all talking about now. Um, one of the issues on this one that was different from the previous disease is 40% of the people have no signs, even though they can transmit. So you're, it's hard to manage that. And then you have people compressed into the third world that are mostly um, informal economy where they've got to get out of the house. They can't stay at home and quarantine or they'll starve. They got to get out of the house to do stuff. You're also compressed at higher birth rates into certain smaller areas. So it, it was a, 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 a mass of mutation possibilities. The more people it goes through, the more diversity it goes through, the greater the uh, potential for mutation. So that's a, a, a gigantic. Therefore, we will have to live with this for some years like AIDS. And that's the conclusion now I'm trying to hear on the press uh, and news commentators all basically all saying all this. Um, New York insights, let's see, what do we got here? Oh, the pandemic, yeah, that was a big deal. Psychological, well, that was another one too, is while writing the scenarios, it's clear that a lot of people are gonna get depressed, which means that your mental health it's going to start being affected not only in the health workers but the general public health as well. So uh, we talked to people who were in the profession and and uh, said, "How about a hotline?" And uh, they were in the process of doing it anyway. So the idea, so we wrote in the scenario that the, the volunteer psychologists, which occurred all the way across the United States, to, so they could call in if you felt depressed about all this stuff, because a lot of people were having psychological problems during these lockdown times. And uh, the U.S. leadership. Uh, a lot better in G7, the G20, and the World Health Organization um, was a big role that's, that's, that's still to be done, uh, which obviously shortens the negative impacts. It helps with financial support and prevents continuation to some degree. Uh, what surprised us, I mentioned, is the efficacy over 90% was a big deal. The number of deaths surprised us also. It, by the year, I think that we had in the scenarios something like 500, over 500, 600,000 deaths, but it's over 800,000 uh, toward the end. And that's what surprised us how big that was. Um, the campaign was was pretty effective, but it, 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 there was a lot of backlash as everybody knew, and we did write that in there. Uh, economic recovery faster than expected. Yeah, that's is also true. Um, these questions are pretty obvious. They're in the, they're in the uh, press right now in the news media. Like how much inflation, when you threw that much money into the, uh, the recovery, it, it, you're bound to get some uh, inflation. And when you mess up your supply chain, you're also gonna get some pressure for prices going up. But how much and how long that'll go on. Uh, but these are all sort of wide open questions that you're hearing all the time. Like, you know, are we gonna get something after the Micron? Are we gonna get, uh, you know, more mutations? And I would say, unfortunately, probably we, we will. The only question is uh, how, how bad the mutations will be for us and how quickly we can do vaccines. With the new mRNA vaccine approach, we can get vaccines done in like a matter of a couple of weeks. Of course, the testing takes longer to get done and double checking it takes longer to get done, but we're in a much different situation today than we were before the pandemic and getting these things out. Probably shouldn't rattle on a whole lot longer, but uh, just a few words here. This is as an Futures organization, to, to me, is one of the key insights to this whole activity. And that is, we've never had the world have a simultaneous timeout before. Uh, you know, most of us are parents, and when the kids act up, you say, time out, sit down, think about what you did wrong. Well, that's what we are doing as a whole species for the first time. We are thinking as a whole world system, we have time, whether we like it or not, to rethink. And as you know, in the United States, uh, there's this great uh, move of a lot of people saying, I'm out of here. I don't want to wait on tables anymore. It's not worth it. I'm, you know, you got a lot of people, you know, four or five million people per month say, I'm out of here. Uh, that's, I think that's part of this rethink that's going on. Um, what do I want to do between birth and death? Do I really want to be an economic animal at a low income wage doing menial stuff? Well, maybe I don't. Well, that's what's happening. A lot of people are thinking like that. And I think uh, increasingly people uh, are taking serious, seriously futures. I've noticed that futures activity going up like a lot in the last year because many of us wrote warnings, weren't paid attention to, 
talked about Homer Dixon just before we came on, but he's, he's worrying about environmental security issues for a long time. We're trying to take those seriously. Uh, the United Nations has now created a, a, our common agenda, which has got foresight stuff all over it uh, coming up. And so more and more people are saying, you know, we have to take these warnings more seriously than we have in the past. So that's one thing that seems to be coming out of it. Another one, or by analogy, uh, we all know that after a forest fire, new growth occurs. Uh, after World War II, multilateralism occurs. So something, some things will be coming out of this uh, great pandemic uh, that I don't think is finished taking shape yet, but the great rethink is in process. Um, so we don't know what's gonna be next <laughs> on the mutation. Mutations are almost by definition impossible to predict, but uh, it's likely that there will be more. Um, and we should just accept, accept that. It's a few words for don't know about the Millennium Project. Uh, it's a decentralized think tank. Uh, we have what we call nodes or groups of individuals and institutions that in the case of the COVID scenarios, identify the top doctors and health officials, people to answer questionnaires. They can also create their own activities, some of the workshops on these things. We get it goes on the news about these things. So they're like, uh, they're like when people about global local, our node structure is our answer manage, managerial answer to the idea of global local. So the local thinking is associated with the global work together, organized coming back to the local and then disseminated through the different languages and workshops and university courses and so forth. Then feedback back up to the over global. So we've been doing global local through this management structure of nodes for 28 years now. Uh, and in those 28 years, we did a lot of research and I expect you to read this. It was just to say, we've done a lot of different, different sort of things. We don't just do environment. We don't just do technology. We don't do just do governance systems. We try to do general futures research. But when we do a specific thing like the uh, virus, we look at the global economics. We look at the global technology. We look at the robotics you know, dealing with the thing and so forth. So we try to have a global general futures research orientation in all the work that we do. One weak point I find in a lot of future stuff is people don't know so much about methodology. As I've mentioned, they're misusing, many people are misusing the scenarios as it is, let alone it's a very popular method, but they're misusing and forgetting the original purpose for writing scenarios. Uh, but here we have uh, 37 different methods, even though it's 39 chapters because there's an introduction, there's a conclusion area, but so 37 different ones. And if all goes well, in about a year or a year and a half, we'll come out with the 4.0 and up, up, upgrade these methods and then maybe add another five or 10. So if you've got a hotshot method on futures research methods, let us know, we can maybe stick it in, they get peer reviewed and all of that. So let's see, does that pretty well wrap it up? Yeah, and then people can get uh, anything they want uh, out of that later on. Okay. I'll stop here and face the music on the questions. You're on mute. Anitra, you're still on mute. Do anything. Ryan is not. Yes. OK, fine. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. I think this was a extremely interesting presentation. I just want to bring up two things. Number one, I think that your nodes must have been extremely important in getting this information around the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it shows all the work you've done in all those years getting the nodes and getting the national arrangements with the nodes to be legal and so forth paid off when you really wanted to get information out. And the yep. second thing is we, of course, from an ecological standpoint, have had uh, Ann Ehrlich as a member with the population bomb, who, of course, predicted this in the 70s, that these large megapolises would be hotbeds, just like any other large population brought together for the microbes and the microorganisms, which would um, 
be able to to uh, duplicate themselves very, very readily when these artificial congregations of plants or animals or people or anything got together. So if we look at the future, uh, one set of scenarios would be to make ourselves less dense or very, very strict about the way we have been, very, very strict about our microbial environments in these megapolises, which now paper the earth on all continents. I'd like your uh, thought about that, and then we'll go into some of the other questions. Canada, of course, had a completely different system than we, which was much more locked down and pay the people to be locked down, and we can handle that. But go ahead, T tell us about your nodes and how they worked, and then your feeling about the future of the megapolises. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, we we usually what we don't we tend not to recruit nodes as such. Um, almost all of them had come to us and said, "Hey, I would like to." You don't have a node in Zimbabwe, and you'll be now be the first to hear this because I just got the email today. That apparently, we're going to be signing uh, an agreement in Zimbabwe, but but people tend to contact us and they say, "Hey, you don't have a node in country X. What's the procedure?" Well, the procedure is you got to find a, a one or two from government that are future oriented, one or two from business that are future oriented, one or two from universities, one or two from NGOs, and one or two from international organizations that are in your country, like the World Health Organization, UNDP, or something like that. And, and the idea, and then have sort of like a little bit of an equality as much as possible between the natural sciences and the social sciences, so that, um, so that you have a mix. Um, just a little pause on that is our, our tent can most management world is a hierarchy, you know, the boss on the top, cleaves on the bottom. And then now we've got a lot of networks like this, uh, networks cut across hierarchies. Uh, to, to, in a sense, you got horizontal uh, sharing rather than vertical. Hierarchy, power goes up and down, horizontal net, so a, so a network sort of feats in a sense higher control, control or reduces it. And then the next step is what we call nodes. And that's where you intersect networks because a network are like-minded people usually. And that's better than not because you're cutting across the hierarchy. So you're getting some richness, you know, different. But then if you intersect like the business community futures and the academic community futures and the maybe the hard science and then the soft science, if you intersect that, then the node itself becomes a richer uh, ability to brain pick in the country. So you're not just having one orientation. Now, where we're evolving from that is what we call fields of play, what I call fields of play, where you put together nodes into a network of these nodes. And we have that in Latin America called Reaver, And we have that in Europe called the Foresight European Network. And there may be one coming up in the Arab community, maybe one coming up in Asia and maybe one coming up in Africa, but we'll see if that happens. And then if those fields of play start functioning well, then the idea would be to hook up the fields of play and then I can put my feet on the desk and get out of here. <laughs> so that's the idea of the note. <laughs> so that's the idea of the note. It's, it's, it's how to fire Jerry. <laughs> anyway, um, now on, on your question about the, I don't see the turning around easily of the trend of clustering humans. Um, one of the lessons I have learned in my 50 years of futures research is no matter what you look at, it's gonna be more complex than you think is possible. And then double it, <laughs> you'll get closer to the truth. So I can imagine both trends going, I can imagine one of the things coming out of the pandemic is a decentralization, moving back to suburbs, moving back to outside of the cities, and so there, and there is that, as you saw in real estate, San Francisco, certainly, in some other cities, that's, that's, that's it's not a gigantic trend, but it's a trend, legitimate trend. That, so that is happening. At the same time, I, can, I see both happening, you know, people going out, but also many people still wanting to cluster. Uh, people sort of still like the old elbow contact. So I, I don't see getting rid of urbanization as a strategy to prevent 
future disease. I just don't think it's going to be, going to be possible. What I, what I, one of the things I do think is maybe possible, and this has been in the military for a while, it's been hushed for some years, so maybe they're making progress, but the idea of a universal vaccine. Now, Fauci has talked about a universal COVID or a certain category of vaccine, but I'm talking about universal vaccine in general. Why? Biological warfare is a big deal coming up, unfortunately, and it's much easier to make a new weapon in biology than it is to make a new vaccine and produce it and make it distributed. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of work and time to do that in the middle of a war. You know, it's a much easier to make another minor tweak up the, 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 the agent. So that approach to communicable diseases is doomed to fail. So uh, to me, the way you've got to do is figure out how is it possible to bring up the immune system without killing somebody? That's part of the problem. <laughs> if the immune system is too strong, you're dead. Uh, so what's the balance? And I was told, I would say 15 years ago uh, by somebody in that conversation in the military that the time of how long the body can handle it is actually a classified thing. <laughs> because you can sort of do your military planning if you understand it's five days or 10 days or whatever it is and troops are moving a certain way. But I suspect that I have not heard squat about this for about five or more years. So I suspect maybe the military uh, DARPA or whatever is getting close to how do you make a universal vaccine, you know, spray it over an area or whatever it is so that you can immunize your troops for a short period of time. So whatever the agent is dies off within a couple of days because there's no spreading, so it's dead. Um, so I would say that uh, how we make universal vaccines or something like that available for this concentration, the urban concentration that, that seems to be still in the cards, even though uh, there is the out, there is an urban outside migration occurring. Thank you very much. Ted Manning from KCOR. Yeah, I, I think we're always trying to for, foretell the future with mixed results, but I, I, I've spent my life as a policy advisor in, in many different countries. And when the politician comes to me, he wants to know what to do today, what to do next, uh, what action can I take? And I'm asking myself, how do, does a range of scenarios filter into that dialogue? And how different is it from culture to culture? I'm not even sure that my country's politicians would react to the same as yours or, or South Africa's or wherever. So I'd really just like to hear your insights on how do we deal with actually providing advice to people who are desperate to get it? Yeah, well, I would give an example of that, that Peace Corps on contact tracing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the scenarios were out of it. Mm -hmm. what, what we had to do with contact tracing now. <laughs> Yeah. And I didn't know that we didn't have enough until I was doing working on this scenario. So there would be an example that, that you can pull stuff out of a scenario. Remember, to me, the idea is, is to make you do better stuff, not to mm. believe the scenario, not to, you know, you know, does the scenario get you to, to call up the Peace Corps, so to speak? Mm -hmm. So I would say what politicians get in the present tense can very much come from those, from those things. Um, and do they listen? Well, you never quite know. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because as you well know, global, you know, national leaders don't like to be told some consultant came in and told them what to say, and then yeah. they, they said it. That's not cool. That you have to keep your mouth shut. Whether you had the impact. That's why I said about the G7. We have no idea if our stuff had if it got into them before. But I don't know. You you never know completely what impact you you've got on those things. But it's but obviously it's better to try <laughs> and not to try. Mm -hmm. uh, we did write a we did do a thing for the U.S. Army years ago. Yeah. Um, I'll see if I can dig it up. It was like how do you integrate futures research and decision making? Mm -hmm. Exactly that. And what we did is we interviewed a whole bunch of people, including two KGB generals, by the way. <laughs> Uh, on, on <laughs> generals, by are you allowed to are yeah. you allowed to tell us their names? Uh, <laughs> I, no, well, well, no, they they'll know. kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, they know who they are. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they're back. one of the one of them offered me a job, but I, I didn't take it <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. But the idea was we interviewed a whole bunch of people and yep. saying, okay, when did your stuff work and when it didn't work to sort of get mm -hmm. the rules of thumb out. 
So we took all that sort of stuff and we did some Delphi's on it and we worked up and we ended up with a list, I think of 26 or 27 things. Yeah. Now, no one can do, that. we've said very quickly, no, we don't expect anybody to do all 26 things, but the more of those you do, according to our research, the more effective you will be. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them is, is really funny. You got to have some method that a decision maker will understand what the hell it was. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there was a guy who was in the Department of Commerce, Assistant Secretary of uh, Department of Commerce, wanted to get the Secretary of Commerce to, to do something. And he printed out the computer paper to make the model. He printed it. There's no model. He just made it up. But the decision maker says, oh, there's this model issues. And that's the, then they'll believe it. You, you got to have something that can't just come up with stuff. Uh, but there's got to be something they can hang their hat on. Uh, another one was you involve the decision maker as much as you can, as possible along the way. Because one of the common mistakes futurists make is for us, we can go from one idea to another idea, to another idea, to another idea, to an aha. And then we go into the office and say, here's aha. He goes, wait a minute. You know, but if you're with the decision maker, was along that way as much as possible. And the easy way to do it is you have one third or half time, whatever it is, update say you know mr president or whatever here's where we are so far what's your feedback so as mm -hmm. much as you can get them involved in the process the the, the better but there's a whole bunch of uh, and, and you know, the, the obvious sort of things like if there is an action what's the impact there is action what's the impact so it's very clear we did this with uh, uh what's his name the guy in azerbaijan uh, we did a, a state of the future index for them and we showed a graph like here's how it's gone but with these three out of the 20 variables, if these got to the best possible, here's the impact. So he, he understood the, 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 the bifurcation of the grant. It was clear as simple. And within 10 days, they ended up doing 10 year plans for each of their ministries or he's supposed to do it. Um, but uh, I can maybe see if well, I can track we that found the politicians, We found that politicians everywhere are exceptionally risk averse. Correct. So if you can, if you got them Correct. by their wallets, their hearts and minds soon follow. Correct. Well, Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's an ethical question that I have no good answer for. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of those 26 things was you got to show an ostensible crisis if you don't make, if you don't do something. Mm -hmm. Well then, then what is, that means that the futurist to be successful has got to figure out What's the most terrible thing to scare the shit out of people? <laughs> well, that's a terrible way to organize the brain. You know? Watch the news. Yeah. But it's effective, unfortunately. You know? Because uh, you, know, you get too many self fulfilling prophecies around. If everybody, I mean, look at how many people think the future's lousy coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Jerome. That's very, very insightful. Thank you. Is it not? Is it not lousy coming up? <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I have, here's my, here's my, here's my evidence. When we had these early 15 global challenges in the very beginning, that came out of a long bunch of stuff. We said, okay, how are you going to measure progress or regress on each other? So we got a whole bunch of variables and we put them together. And then we said, okay, give me the, you got to have 20 years of data. You got a trend curve going. So you say, okay, what's the best possible var uh, value for that variable? And then average all the answers together. And what's the plausible worst value for that variable in 10 years, average them all together. So that gives you a way to normalize the data between good and bad. So the index goes up, it's good. The index goes <laughs> down, it's bad, right? So when we've been doing this over now, for this particular index, uh, 22 years now, because as a matter of fact, right now as we speak, and I should send you out an invitation to uh, participate. We're doing a 2030 Say the Future Index right now. Now, what I can say is that in most of the variables, we have been improving consistently over time. So the way I would put it is the following. We're winning more than we're losing. But where we are losing is deadly serious. So you have no right to go to sleep but you have no right to be pessimistic either. So that's one part of the answer to you. Because uh, that's as empirical as anybody else's guy, as far as I can. Nothing is totally empirical. But I mean, that's as empirical as I, I can think. Now, another thing is that most of us got enough gray hair to be involved in the Cold War. We know that majority of people thought World War III between the Soviet Union and the United States was inevitable. You know, if you ever gave talks in the 70s and 80s is how many people think we're going to have World War III. 
most of the hands would go up. Well, and it's a reasonable prediction because if you take the history, when two or more great powers confront each other, they tend to use the weapons of the day, maybe even invent some along the way. Um, but that didn't happen this time. And I'll give you another reason for being optimistic. When I did the, uh, as Nature pointed out, I was involved in helping packet switching because around the third world. So that's what makes internet. Uh, and um, in the process of doing that, we thought everything was gonna be great and glorious. I mean, we thought we were wizards with magic wand running around the world, connecting up all the computers. This is great, smiles, smiles, smiles. We didn't think about all the negative stuff that much, a little bit, but not that much. There wasn't a whole lot of technology uh, assessments going on, you know, but. I'm also on the, now I'm on the IEEE thing on AI governance. And I'm telling you the details of activities going on and assessing AI is going like crazy worldwide. There are thousands of conferences, millions of articles. I mean, tons of assessments. Every country's got definitions of how to make right and all that. I'm not saying that we're doing great on it, but I am saying the, uh, the, the, the maturity of the human species on a critical technology in the IT space anyway, was naive with internet, not naive when it came to AI. That's a maturation process in my judgment. Thank you. Dave Doherty is going to ask you the next question. Dave, are you unmuted? Uh, yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. gotcha. Okay. The question is this. Um, the standard approach is to assume that economic growth is good, and I did see that in, I guess I could call it your positive scenario. What if economic stability or even degrowth are what we need to ensure that we have no ecological collapse that leads to right. societal? Right. Was, uh, was this not the fact? Right, right. Uh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, the Quakers hired me in 1971 to organize the environmental movement in New England. So. I'm with you, <laughs> um, but of the 29 variables, if you look at our the Delphi coming up on the uh, State of the Future Index, you'll see that economic growth is only one 29th of it. And a lot of the other variables is what, what that growth is about. So I agree with you completely. Uh, we've got to do some dramatic change. That's why I spent a little time on that, that water drop in the scenario there about time to rethink everything. We have to rethink what's the purpose of life anyway? Am I just an animal, an economic animal between birth and death? That's, that's it, without any thinking. Um, the, a lot of the, the change of mind around the world is obviously not yet complete, but at least people are paying a lot more lip service to it. When I talked about doing co-energy generation, you know, the waste heat, one factory going into the other one sort of, I was called a communist. I mean, they were gonna make, they were gonna save money. It's good, good capitalism to make a profit, you know, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of change. Now, I grant you, it's not been fast enough. I wrote about climate change in 1973 for the Committee for the Future. I would never have thought that 50 years later, we'd still be discussing you know, uh, how serious this is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, there, there, was a, there was an offshoot of the Club of Rome some years ago talked about, uh, uh, about no limits to knowledge growth. It was run out of somebody at the Department of Education or something like that. Jim Podkin, no limits to it? learning. No is limits okay. to learning. Yeah, right. Jim right. Podkin. Yeah. Right, so the idea of growth uh, I'm in favor of. I'm just not in favor of cancer. And I think that that we can use this this uh, crisis, this this, this virus this crisis, to, to to do a lot of rethinking now. I mean, this is I, I tell the no chairs all the time to to use that little slide uh, of the rethink time uh, is to use this time to you know what do we really want to be. Now, uh, to rattle on just a little bit longer, if you accept the hierarchy of needs of Maslow's stuff, and if you accept that uh, the extreme poverty was around, it was more than 50% in 1981, 
And now it's closer to 8%, 8 to 9%. It's not a little because of the current crisis going on. But it, we're under, under and, and, the, and the rate is going down rather dramatically. Had we not had the virus, we probably would have hit the UN Millennium Development Goal of essentially getting rid of extreme poverty by the year 2030. That's a trend curve, by the way. Um, so I, I bring that part up to say that the, the physical needs of clothing, health, shelter, and so forth for the majority of humanity is being met. And for better or for worse, some of the two thirds of the world that's on the internet are getting their social security, their social needs met, some of them, a lot of them, on, on the, these, these, these chat groups. And so they're getting their love and belonging, self-esteem and so forth, some degree met. So we're slowly moving up the hierarchy of self-actualization. And I did a report on the future work and technology and the third scenario was on self-actualization economy that more and more people, I think, uh, are taking the idea that, oh, what do I want to be? That wasn't much of a choice in the past. I mean, you had to fit in. That was the only issue was how do I fit in? Not only how do I fit in, how do I fit in my local situation? Not how do I fit in the world? I've had, uh, what, three, 400 interns for 30 years or so. And one of the trends I can tell you is the idea that I don't want to make a living doing something that's not good. Before it was, how do I make a living? Period. How do I get a job after this internship? That was the focus. Now it's much more like, how do I contribute to the global good? That is an increasing phenomenon that I have noticed, at least in the interns that I, I get. So there's reason to be optimistic, but there's also reason to be pessimistic on some of this stuff. But overall, as I started before I started this long harangue, uh, we're winning more than we're losing. But where we're losing is serious. So we have no right to be pessimistic and we have no re right to go to sleep either. Thank you. Uh, Van, you had a comment? Oh, Van Hudson? Yeah, yeah, I did. I do. So. <laughs> um, Jerry, e eons ago, I uh, used a publication that Herman Kahn wrote when he was at the Rand Corporation on the Monte Carlo method. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and I, I fortunately was able to use that to good effect in, in my dissertation, correcting experiments by that had some error stuff in them. And uh, so I had I'd known Herman for a long time, and once uh, spent uh, a week at the Hudson Institute where he harangued us all day long with. <laughs> propedeutic and heuristic methodologies and paradigms and such yep. stuff. So, and yep. I, I ran a um, futures planning group for the Diocese of California in, in the late 60s, early, early 70s. And I was asked uh, at some time, I, uh, uh, after my time at the Livermore Lab, I spent some time as a consultant and went back to the lab to uh, work on contracts uh, to do surveys of methods for future research. And this was for the uh, Institute for Global Conflict and Cooperation of the lab. And uh, my conclusion at the end of that was the Millennium Project was the best of the ones I could find. So, and, and you've gotten much, much better. So this was, God, this was in the, uh, early 80s or so uh, and you've gotten much much better since then i'm really thank you really impressed with, with what you're able to do and piece together and it's your ability to articulate it so other people can understand it including the non-experts so thank you very much for your work well thank you for your services they say too <laughs> <laughs> ryan did you did you have a comment yeah, I, I could uh, bring something up. So, um, Jerry, I, I've spent most of my career overseas helping in poor countries dealing with these things. And most of the time, people were lining up to get vaccinated for various things. As you're doing these models, um, have you been able to incorporate uh, vac vaccine hesitance, uh, oh, hesitancy yeah. into all of this? And my second yeah. part of that yeah. is... Based on your models, is there 
an effective way to reduce this, whether through vaccine mandates or some other way or education? What? How can we get through this? <laughs> Sorry. Well, we did. We didn't make uh, models. We had mental models, of course, but we did not have computer models on it. But yeah, the anti-vax thing we had in there, uh, and this also uh, brings up the issue of information warfare. Um, I wrote about this 30 years ago. Um, and I, when I say information warfare, I don't mean cyber warfare. Cyber warfare, you know about it, you break something up, it's command and control, it's you know all the rest of that stuff, viruses, ransomware. Information warfare, by its nature, you don't know it exists. Yeah. That's what it's, that's the whole idea. And so uh, as, as there was a lot of that in the uh, 2016 campaign, uh, and as, we're, that is, as the public is finding out, that it was far deeper and wider than people ever realized. But, but that's the idea of <laughs> information warfare. It's supposed to be that way. And uh, it's still going on, but now China is coming in as a big king. Uh, in my understanding, and I'm not sitting in the desk to keep track of all the numbers, but, but, but those that have been interviewed say that China now is ahead of uh, Russia. Uh, but there are different motivations. The China motivations, I understand it, is to get the attention away from them <laughs> and on to the United States being screwed up. You know, don't, don't, don't talk about this guy over behind the curtain. <laughs> talk about this. But Russia's interest was different. It was like, you know, how do you, how do you make the United States weak? Um, and whereas China not, didn't know it make us weak as a country. It was just like, get off of this virus pointing the finger at us. But my understanding is it's far more in China. Um, information warfare, I think, is extraordinarily important and is not being dealt with in a serious enough way yet. Uh, if anybody's interested, I can send you some stuff on that. Um, but the anti-vax stuff, uh, uh, much of it, and my belief, I don't have classified information, but my belief is much of it goes back to China. And it, now, it doesn't invent it. It's like the idea of information, you find out something, like the cuts, you need to have visions in cuts in society to begin with. What you're doing is you're getting in it and using the right vocabulary to say, I don't like to I hate, or I might not to I will not. And so what you've done is you've taken a situation and just eh, put salt in the wound, so to speak. Uh, and that's, I believe, much more what's happening now. How do you forecast that with China? No, we didn't get into that in the scenarios. And we didn't mention China in the scenarios. Yeah. Uh, I have a note in Beijing, and I hope to be able to <laughs> still cooperate. <laughs> As a matter of fact, China's published all of our stuff. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So his Iran, so his Iran. It starts off in the name of God, state of the future. Yeah. Great. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. John Gilmore, did you have a you need to unmute yourself? You're muted, John. Yes. Yes. No, thank not, you. I'm, I'm right here. Jerome, I'm sitting with a sub-Saharan uh, perspective, and I am interested in a two-part uh, question. The one is, are you suggesting that the widening economic gap, the divide amplified by the digital divide is a myth? Or are we looking at a problem, a, a, a self-actualizing acceleration in the one divide, half of the divide, and a regression in the other? And if so, you know, there's a problem. And in your millennium um, work, the, the, the issue number nine, which is related to education in particular, has, has this, the last work that you've been doing, impacted on that in any way related to this issue of the digital divide and the economic divide and the possible yeah. consequences of that? Yeah, yeah. The the digital divide is clearly narrowing. That's empirical. Um, the economic divide is getting worse. That's also empirical. But that doesn't contradict that extreme poverty is not going down. You know, 
it's one thing to say somebody in a dollar ninety cents, the numbers of those people are going down. That's a fact. But the divide is getting broader. So you can have, you can you could eliminate poverty and still have ex the economic divide getting larger at the same time. Because I mean, you've probably seen that during the pandemic, the top one percent. Uh, <laughs> has made a fortune and the bottom 50% hasn't <laughs> gone down economically. Uh, so it's not a contradiction. You can still have the divide, uh, but, but the digital divide, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's gonna be over. Uh, uh, it's conceivable. You know, you're may, may be aware that, matter of fact, I had the pleasure of having the first private account of internet access in South Africa didn't even know what to charge me. <laughs> uh, so I was very aware of how people said, this will only be for rich people. Third world will never use that. That's one of the reasons I said, baloney, we'll hook them up to third world as fast as possible. Um, but now you've got Elon Musk with these microsats completing the internet network within a handful of years. Um, you've got, you've got, Two thirds of the world have internet access today. And the ability to get it around is more in the future than it was in the past. I mean, to get packet switching done, I had to get into a jet plane and go somewhere. You know, I had to stay in a hotel. Now you can send information immediately around the world. We have internet as a platform for helping the last third get hooked up. And so I would be very surprised if, if anybody that wants internet access doesn't have it by 2030, regardless of their economic status, I'd be very surprised. But will there still be economic disparity, large scale, it'd be 2030? Yes, unfortunately. Now on this, the self-actualization scenarios, um, there, yes, most of, like a lot of stuff, it, it happens with the rich before it happens with the poor. It's just like, you know, the glasses on your head. The rich people had those to begin with. Now, even poor people have glasses. Um, so I think that um, more and more people will slowly realize they can make a living out of being themselves. In the past, you had to get the job, fit in, and walk to it. The idea of having multi-employers worldwide was a zero idea just 30 years ago. Now the gig economy is the fastest growing thing as a sector in the world. Something like 17%, I think, is in the gig, gig economy, but depending on some people's studies. A lot of these definitional stuff is very sloppy. So you gotta watch watch the definitions on these things. But the idea of only fitting into a nine to five job uh, is under threat. You've still obviously got a, a, about, what, 700, 800 million people below the poverty line. And that's not going away tomorrow morning, but it conceivably, it can start to go down. And as more and more people get savvy about how to find markets for themselves worldwide, then more and more people will try it out. Um, you know, you don't need a very high percentage of the world to be interested in what you're interested in selling. Trick is how do you get to those 100 people in the whole world, or those 200 people in the whole world that's willing to pay you something uh, electronically on the system? That's a new thought. Right now, we have an education system that says, you will fit in this way. And you're all gonna walk in lockstep from grade one to grade two. <laughs> Slowly, that's, that, that model is breaking up. There, there is, a, we, we give the example of Finland and South uh, Korea. Finland, you may know, a couple of years ago said, wait a minute, let's open up the game. I mean, we're not needing just training economic animals. These people have a right to be a human being the way they want to. How do they self-actualize? How do they you know, find out their talents, explore their passion, all the famous rich people when they're interviewed, they say, what was your secret? They say, I followed my passion. 
Well, do we teach school kids to do that? No, we are teaching you to fit in this way at the same time everybody else is fitting in at the same time because they're being trained for the factory model, so to speak. Um, that's changing. Finland has shown when they did that change about no textbooks and you know, no, 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 a few textbooks and, and not homework and freeing up what they're studying, all of that. They, they, they made an agreement. They said, all right, we're going to have to accept if we do this, that our test scores worldwide will go down. We will not do as well on the mass scores, will not do as well and so forth and so forth. So they were prepared for it. Turns out you can do this Google search on this and the top math scores, high school, whatever. Finland is right up there with South Korea. That shocked the Finnish people. It's a son of a gun works. Now, the, the model of education of South Korea and Finland is about as different as exists on the planet. And yet they both have the same high grades in math. And so I think as more and more people see this, they'll start to realize well, we now have the ability for people to learn anything at any time at any location. We did not have that before. That's why we had a schoolhouse, because that's where the knowledge was. You had to go there. Well, that's no longer the case. And especially if you get everybody on the internet, especially if you free or almost no cost access, then people can learn what interests them at the moment that they're interested in it. That's a completely different model of education, but we're moving in that direction. Now, Going back to the development gap stuff, if you're starting to make a living being who you are and being okay with all that, then I don't, you know, if I'm really making a living at what I like to do, like this at this moment, uh, then I don't care if you're making a whole lot more tomorrow than I did. What I care about is my life. Is my life fascinating? Is it interesting? Is it enjoyable? Or my self-actualization? Because then the measure isn't just how many dollars you got in the bank. The measure is, are you an interesting person? Are you living an interesting life? Are you cool, et cetera? I think we're in that transition, beginning that transition. But it'll take a long time because it makes people very insecure. How can I walk out of school without a guarantee of a job? It's terrifying because right now we say, I I am an economist or I am an engineer. Why? Because I have a degree and my boss says I am. I get my identity from my boss. But me getting my identity from myself, my own freedom? God, that's terrifying. What happens if I screw up? So we're in that period. And, and, and in the scenario on self-actualization, one of the key variables to make it work is the arts. If you get the writers in music, writers in TV, writers in movies, in dance and operas, start to get the idea it's cool to create your own life. That's not a, 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 it's not a recognized value yet. And culture change is run by the arts. So that was one of the key variables in there. So if you're, so that's what I, I push the art community. <laughs> we even have an art media node in Los Angeles, of course, where else? <laughs> Um, and that's one of the things it's working on. How do you get writers to throw some of these new values in there? Because people are insecure about, you know, creating their own life. Self are, are we okay with that, John? John, you're on mute. It's, it's, yeah, no, I'm not. It's, it's difficult to, to be completely okay with it because I, I'm, I'm living in a reality where Education is 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 not a reality for you know so many people in Af in sub-Saharan Africa. So to transition from you know that to the self-actualizing theme requires a very clear strategy. I I suspect as it accelerates in the Eurocentric world, it will it will it will leave real complexities in the inequity. But you know. Oh, I agree. I didn't, I'm not suggesting for a moment that this is going to be easy. I think it'll be the biggest transition that humanity has ever made. John so. and Mampella Rempella have a, a school for the townships where they teach science and mathematics to secondary students from only the townships, black students in South Africa. And they've made a huge success over almost 20 years, oh. but th this is his 
focus are the poorest of the poor, the most economically challenged. And, and, where, and where I agree entirely with you, Jerome, is that the focus of education must shift away from content to consciousness and to insight and to metacognition and to, and to elements of learning that have previously been not called out and, and, and uh, in a colonial model, not regarded as important, the emotional development. So I'm, I'm you know, but the shifting, the shifting a system which still is essentially shaped by a colonial model of uh, yep. uh, repression yep. in order to stay dominant yep. is really, it's, it's not going to happen purely because there's a drag effect. There's going to, yep. There has to be intervention and it's going to have to be coherent intervention. And I'm just a bit worried that if we, if we send the narrative that regardless of how bad things are, things are actually getting better, there's going to be a real... Uh, now, remember what I said. I said, we're, what I said we're yeah. winning more than we're losing. But where we're losing yeah. is very serious. So if you look at our winning and losing yeah, okay. report okay. card, development gap or the rich poor gap is smack dab right in the middle of that. So we're losing. There. Okay. I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, okay. but, and, um, uh, but I'm not pessimistic about it. I just have a long, I guess a long view. It sounds trite, but I understand that's, I mean, I, I worked in Malawi. It was, it was poor in South Africa, <laughs> you know? And so I'm very aware, I got the mud on my boots and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but at the same time, one thing that's a little lesson of that, I was, when I went back to Malawi 13 years later, doing the partnership of productivity stuff, uh, economic development, I was, was teaching illiterate accounting to this shopkeeper, where you just have pictures of the, the bills across the pictures of the, or your drawings of, of the product, and you would fill it out. And so when we started to do the, the adding it up, the guy reaches under his counter and pulls out a hand calculator. I'm telling you, I was in one of the poorest districts, Kota Kota district in Malawi, central Malawi. And I was in the northern part of it, one of the poorest areas of the poorest areas and out whips this guy with a hand, oh, it was a simple hand calculator, but it was a hand calculator, which means he did not have to know the mathematics as much as before. So I'm seeing that a lot of the things that we had to know before are getting automated and the costs are coming down. So when, to me, there's a lot of, you almost have to draw this as a vector map of all kinds of different forces. So I mentioned one vector was the arts. And if you want to call that an intervention, okay, that's an intervention. I mean, I, I actually talked to, this will kill you. I was in one place in, Hawaii, uh, not, uh, in, in LA, did one of these art media things. And I said, you know, if Al Gore, can get an Academy Award for a PowerPoint presentation, what could the talent in this room do? Well, they all jumped up, yay, because most of these people were making a living doing commercials for toothpaste or something. I mean, you know, it, 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 it nonsense stuff, and they knew it was nonsense, but they had to fit in, right? And if, they, if, we, if we give them this mission as much as possible to intervene, I mean, a, a television show doesn't have to do everything. It, you just have a couple of ideas in there but a lot of the writers have never felt licensed to put ideas in there. Um, I could go rattling on a long time. To me, yes, the transition is extremely, extremely, extremely hard. And I, and I think that like about a hundred things ought to be done. And one answer is not gonna do it. <laughs> it's gonna be a whole slew of stuff that's gonna do it. Just the idea of the entrepreneurial, you're talking about consciousness and awareness. Entrepreneurial consciousness is not exactly majority of the world either. <laughs> You know, hmm. you know, and another thing about Africa has always been a problem. I, I hung out with the nighttime with the witch doctors because daytime was a Western medicine and nighttime was a, the, uh, the traditional doctors, whatever you want to call them. Healers. One of the I, yeah. One of the, one of the things I learned was uh, a, a center part of, of quote, witching somebody was about jealousy. If your corn was grown higher than my corn, you made me ashamed. And therefore I have a right to witch you and have your give problems to your, your family. So jealousy was a gigantic thing I found in, 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 in dealing with some of this, some of the witchcraft stuff. Um, well, right now, if you go to Silicon Valley, if you come up with a hotshot idea and, 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 and you outthought your boss, 
you get a raise. And your other you know, old colleagues take you out for lunch. How'd you come up with that? That was very cool. That is a very narrow cultural state. As you well know, in most of Africa, if you outthink your boss, boom, you're gone. <laughs> you don't dare outthink your boss. But you have to be a think, think your boss in a creative culture and so forth. We don't have, so there's just tons of stuff that's gotta be done. But I'm not pessimistic because I can see clearly this is possible. And I do think it's inevitable. May I go on with, with questions from yeah, sure. Phil and, and Phil Riley? Are you there? Are you coming up on the screen? Okay, Miles, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Miles Flegg. I'm here in Calgary, Canada. And uh, I was supposed to be on the road driving to British Columbia, but the roads are terrible with snow. So yeah. I'm a follower of the work of Carl Jung. And I'll yeah. say that it's numinous that I'm here today. And I, I'm now able to bring greetings from Dr. Silish Rao. And uh, in the chat, I've posted his note to me that he what he wanted me to share with you. Yes, uh, I see it. Three World Three modeling. Uh, he wants to talk to anybody about a two loop approach. Anyway, I have no idea what that involves, but his link to his organization that he founded called Climate Healers is there. Um, Dr. Rao shares uh, your passion for. Um, you know, waking up and deciding I'm wasting my time uh, it may be lucrative, but it's not fulfilling. I, I've got a quote from Mark Twain here. I'll just read it. Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just <laughs> ain't so. <laughs> And Dr. Yeah. Rao, he is, uh, I don't know if you know him, but he led a team, he's Stan a Stanford trained PhD in electrical engineering, system engineering, had a lucrative career at Intel, is considered a pioneer in creating a team that sped up the internet for us. Um, and then when he uh, realized one day that working for Al Gore, which he was, he was on that team with Al Gore, there's a, there's a blind, they have blinders on because uh, unfortunately uh, we, uh, we are in a global warming crisis, which is actually a biodiversity collapse, which is actually a values crisis in ourselves. And his global sensitivity analysis says, uh, you know, the UN, the reason they're not making any progress is because they're, they, they think they know what the problem is. Uh, they don't realize, according to him, and he wants to debate anybody who will step up to the plate and debate with him, that uh, you, unless you incorporate into the modeling that since we started eating cows, pigs, goats, sheep, chicken, and fish, and we've destroyed, we've denuded the terrestrial forests from six trillion to three trillion trees. And we've, we're doing the same in the ocean forests. The modeling is, uh, is, is all wrong that the UN is using because uh, essentially we have to uh, change our attitude and change our diet. So um, yep. just wondering if you're aware of his work and how many of the uh, modelings that you're doing are incorporating this concept of, of what we've done for 12,000 years with industrial animal agriculture, meat and right. dairy. So right. anyway, thank you. Oh, and can I just yeah. say one more thing? I, I yeah. know I'm taking a bit of time, but um, right. <laughs> we did Canada apparently... Um, absconded with one of the leading virologists from the United States. I don't know her name, but uh, a mainstream media outlet uh, called W5 with the CTV network here in Canada, they just recently put out a documentary. It's only about 21 minutes. I posted the link. W5 fears growing that another global pandemic is on the horizon. 
experts warn the next pandemic could come sooner than you think, and that unless changes are made to industrial farming practices worldwide, like China with 10 story car parks of crowded pig farms, no social distancing for these cows, pigs, and chickens, and goats, um, and they're just pumping them with antibiotics. It goes on to say it could spark a virus that's more deadly than COVID-19. Thank um, you. Yeah. Be yeah. Before you reply, Jerry, I'm trying to get everybody out of here in three or four minutes. And Jean Doherty would like to thank you. And I would like to thank you, she, on behalf of the KCOR. So if we can have a short answer to this, I would be personally very happy. I know that's a long and involved question. All right. I'll try to do a juggler vein here. If we go from genetic material to hamburger and from genetic material to leather and genetic material from all the various biological stuff, then we can substitute. Um, hold on a second here. Hello. Good. Love those marketing calls you can hang up on. Okay. Now, let's see what happened here. Here we go. Uh, so if we make meat without growing animals, we make fish without growing fish, we make leather without stripping the hide off the cows, that'll go a long way. Uh, there's an FAO study you probably know about back in 2006, I think, that looked at the livestock industry as having more impact than the transportation industry on total greenhouse gas. And that's just cow farts. I mean, it's the whole nine yards. And we're in the process of getting that done. Now, we've already got the plant-based meat that's going faster than people thought. Because we've been, as you look at the Committee for the, uh, the State of the Future reports, we've had this idea of meat without, since 2000, the year 2000. Uh, and I'll and a little quick note on Africa, it's Africa's fault, because I was in Mozambique, going to give a talk, scratching my head the night before, what am I going to say that these people are going to really listen to? Because I want to talk about some far out stuff, and they're not going to listen to what I'm saying. So, you know, I'm Malawi's right next to it. I knew uh, what the interests were. So I said, ah, cows are the interest. What's the future of cows? Ooh, you don't need the cow. Cut out the middleman. Go from the genetic material to the hamburger. That'll get their attention. And so that's what got me into that back there. And Al Gore, by the way, doesn't talk about meat. He talks about all kinds of stuff, but he doesn't. And nice thing about talking about the UN, one thing that did advance on the UN was the last meeting said 30% methane cutting out by 2030. Well, that's agriculture to a large degree. So it's getting the spotlight slowly moving toward agriculture. It's not totally there yet, but it's moving. So again, we're winning more than we're losing, but if we, we're not winning yet. We got to keep on pushing. Yeah. Both Usacor and and KCOR are extremely happy to have listened to this fascinating Delphi discussion. I'm going to let uh, Jean Doherty, president of the Canadian Club of Rome, express her thanks on behalf of her group. Jean? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anitra, and thank you, Jerry, very much for um, an absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, you brought up a lot of things that uh, I hadn't really thought about and um, really interesting ideas on how you can do some of the modeling and surveys and, and thinking into the future in the scenarios. That was really, really interesting. And thank you for US Core for inviting KCOR to come in and, in and enjoy this particular presentation. I look forward to others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. We're, we're uh, more than grateful to you for all this help you've been with our registration. But this was a marvelous, clear, as Van said, very clear, very concise. And I know you had a huge amount of data. We have the report and we're very, very grateful for this rather voluminous discussion as well as that you came out with the report asking these long-term questions because very few people have asked the long-term questions, I think. I think that's one of the big missing items from COVID. Nobody's saying, how can we prevent this in the long-term from again and again and again occurring? So thank you. Anybody else needs to say thank you? Van, Ryan, 
Ted. <laughs> We're all grateful. Thank you, Jerry. You're well, thank you. And I'll try to get this video posted uh, this afternoon. And we'll send it to you. It'll be posted on USA Club of Rome. What, what is it, Ryan? You tell them. At USAClubofRome.org or on the USACOR uh, YouTube channel. So uh, it'll be on both places. So it'll be up there for several years if you want to refer people to it. Thank you. Okay. okay. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.